get started, uh, welcome everybody to uh, these uh, professor's rounds uh, by an effort by the American Epilepsy Society to bring um, education in a time that um, uh, it's been very difficult for everybody, not only for education, but uh, their home places and um, hospitals, etc. Um, I just wanted to go over a couple of the Zoom features that will be available today. And I uh, just want you to be aware. Uh, number one, uh, in your tab, control tab, there's a, a question and answer uh, that you can type your question there um, and it'll come up on my screen and hopefully everybody can see it if I can read the questions as well. Uh, there's also a chat feature and uh, we also have a uh, poll uh, feature that I'll be using today uh, with multiple options uh, for the attendees to, uh, to answer the questions. So uh, this uh, is meant to be an interactive session. Um, I think that these uh, Zoom sessions have been a little str struggle a little bit with the, uh, the interactive part because uh, people generally don't don't interact as much, but I'm hoping that uh, we can interact a little bit and um, get people to uh, to participate. Okay. Um, so having said that, let me start uh, with my uh, disclosures. Uh, I'm assuming everybody can see my slides. If uh, anybody has difficulty uh, looking at the slides or uh, hearing uh, me, please uh, holler at me. Uh, on the chat, they can send me a message or uh, uh, or the questions. Also, there is a um, uh, attendees can raise their their hand if they have a question or a comment, and I can stop um, for them to um, interact with the whole group. Okay. So these are my disclosures. I, I don't have any conflicts of interest or disclosures to make, except that some of the slides were provided by Dr. Hasbani and by Dr. McGuire, one of my uh, prior fellows who worked in one of these cases before. Uh, today, I'm gonna go over uh, three pediatric uh, epilepsy cases that uh, were and have been challenging for us. So uh, let's go dive into our first case. Uh, before I start, I have a first poll question and let's see how this works. Uh, you should see the poll question uh, going on your screen in a second. I'm gonna launch the poll and I'm gonna wait for everybody to answer. So please see if, if the poll uh, popped up in your screen, just uh, go ahead and answer the poll. Three, four. Okay. Uh, you know, five, we're missing two people. Uh, but I think I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna end the poll. Just 30 seconds is more than enough. Wait, wait. Okay, so this is awesome. A very high level. You have a lot of epilepsy fellows. I'm gonna end the poll. I'm gonna try to share uh, the results. Let me see if you can see it on the screen. If not, I'll tell you there are uh, two child neurology or neurology residents, three epilepsy fellows, two neurology or child neurology attendings, and then Christina. Okay, so and that helps me to uh, uh, for the cases and so forth. So let's go on the first case. And this is a nine-year-old boy that uh, came to me on a Saturday. I was on call with one of my fellows, and we see this boy that came from home. He had a he had fever and one seizure. And uh, when we we're evaluating the patient, he was coming around. He was waking up, and as we we're examining him, he goes into a full-blown uh, tonic-clonic seizure. Um, we didn't know at that point, but um, he became, we started treating him right away. We used benzodiazepines, loaded him with IV levetiracetam, 
and um, he just kept seizing uh, on and off, and he basically evolved into status epilepticus. Um, I'm gonna have to uh, change the sharing of the screen in a second. Um, you'll see it in one second, so bear with me. Wait a second. Okay. Okay. I'm hoping that you're able to see what I'm showing right now. And the first thing that you see on his background EEG is that he's very encephalopathic, very slow, a lot of delta waves. And as he comes into the seizure, which I'm going to try to play, um, I'm hoping these uh, shows well on your screen. I don't have an audio for this, so you can hear me. But you can see him developing these jerky movements. Uh, he's already intubated, and he's active. It's a lot of muscle on the uh, temporalis leads, and you can see that his uh, delta activity starts to get organized into like rhythmic, uh, sharply contoured delta activity and it's going to become closer and closer as his um, clinical activity gets worse. I'm going to forward a little bit and uh, let me decrease the um, I don't think it was able to decrease the, the sensitivity from here but I want you to show you the movements that he's doing. You can see that there's these rhythmic complexes of almost polyspike and slow wave, as he has these a pretty violent tonic-clonic seizure. And it's an electrographic seizure in that those complexes are changing in frequency and time and amplitude. And you can see how the frequency gets like fuller and fuller as the seizure evolves and they're trying to stop the seizure there so, so um he went into Ignacio, status we, we can't see your video okay nobody can see the video no i just asked in the chat okay correct can't see the video cannot see the video either okay one second can can they see the eeg yes we can see the eeg one second. We tried this before. Go back. Can they see the video now? No, it's still a black screen. We did the same thing as we tried before, Christina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One second, one second. Let me see. Let me try one, two. Can they see the video now? No, it's still black. One second. Always with the videos. One second. Let me make it make it small. They saw the EEG, so let me try to uh, share only the video part. Now? No, it's a black screen. Oh. One second. Check computer sound. It sounded like we could hear the audio of the video. Can you see it now? No image. Well, that sucks. Okay, I'm sorry. The video is embedded with the video EEG file. Um, basically, one second. Were they able to see the EEG? Yes, we could all see the EEG. 
he's basically intubated in his bed and was having a, a pretty violent tonic-clonic seizure that could not be stopped with uh, medicines as I'm gonna uh, follow next. I uh, apologize for the video. We tried it right before and it did work and I don't know why it didn't. It's embedded with the EEG, it's not a separate file. So when I share the screen, it doesn't come up into my shareable uh, options. So he evolved into a very refractory, a super refractory status epilepticus. And um, all these medicines were tried at, at some point. He stayed in the hospital for a long time, as you could see that uh, to try all these medicines. Um, the workup included an MRI that I'm gonna show up next. And um, basically his workup was pretty much negative. The autoimmune encephalitis was negative. Uh, epilepsy panel has some variants of unknown significance and extensive infectious workup was negative. We did even cytokines and, cytokines and his CSF that were negative. Um, so this is the MRI. You can see that the initial MRI was basically a normal brain. And on the follow-up, uh, besides having these increased signal in uh, different areas of the brain, there was also some loss uh, of brain matter, some atrophy of the brain. Um, with this, I wanted to bring my second poll question just to get an idea um, what people were thinking about this case. Uh, let me launch the polling and see uh, what people think the most appropriate diagnosis would be at this point. seconds. This also, also helped me to see who's actually uh, paying attention on the, on the Zoom. But um, we have four out of eight votes. Okay. So there you go. Okay. That's pretty good. Let me share the results. Christina, can you all see the results when I share them? No, I can't see it this time. I saw the poll question, but I can't see the results. It says, it says it's being shared. Everybody should be able to see it. And I don't know when you go to your screen under the poll, you can see the results for each of the questions. Basically, uh, two uh, people answer answered Norsey, Norse, uh, five uh, fires, and two NMDA receptor encephalitis. So let me continue. Um, basically, this entity has changed names uh, several times across along the years. And uh, the disease of entity of new onset refractory epilepsy has gone through uh, these changes. So I'm going to go over mostly the concept, concepts of NORS and FIRES. NORS is new onset refractory status epilepticus. It's mostly an adult disease. And um, FIRES um, is the febrile infection or febrile illness related epilepsy syndrome. But Bear in mind that these have been named uh, different ways when you look in the literature, including the ones that you can see in the slide. Um, this is from the consensus definitions uh, that were put, uh, put forth in 2017 uh, through the Norris Institute, and they were endorsed by the Critical uh, Care EG Monitoring Research Consortium, and uh, where Norris was basically defined as a clinical presentation, not a specific diagnosis. Uh, in a patient without active epilepsy, he comes um, uh, with a new onset of very refractory status epilepticus without a clear cause or any active structural toxic or metabolic issues. Um, they include a patient with viral or immune causes and they would uh, divide them whether uh, either was a, a cause they could identify or not. Whereas for fires, they, one of the main things that was present in this case, actually this case was a fires case, 
it was the fever. And the fever um, could happen anywhere from two weeks up to 24 hours prior to the onset of the refractory status epilepticus. And uh, you could have fires, uh, it's more commonly described in children, but you can have it at, uh, at older ages. This Charuta is telling me that, uh, can, she sh can she see the slides or can the people see the slides at least or not? You should be able to see the slides. Oh. We could see your slides. That was in reference to sharing the poll results. Cool. We'll see how the next video works. I have a video for each of the cases, but sorry about, about that. Uh, the fires is a condition that is most commonly uh, in children three to 15, and um, they can have other nonspecific symptoms prior, prior to the refractory status epilepticus. But uh, the typical uh, case is, uh, as in this case, that has a negative workup, they don't have ADM, um, they don't have uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis or, or anything else that, um, that you can diagnose. Uh, they have an acute phase, uh, like these patients stayed for in, in more than two months in status epilepticus. And the chronic phase, the patients that I've seen with fires, all of them end up with a very refractory um, epilepsy. Um, the mortality is high, up to 30% of the patients uh, can die, and um, the survivors uh, have significant um, intellectual disability. Some of my patients have had, uh, or sometimes even motor deficits, but um, the hallmark is nearly all 100% of these patients end up with um, refractory seizures. Okay. As far as the mechanisms uh, of how uh, children go into fires, uh, they think there could be an activation of microglia and astrocytes and uh, interleukins as, as seen on this slide. Uh, mainly interleukin 1 beta has been um, suspected as uh, playing a role in how uh, these patients go into refractory status epilepticus. But all of these uh, interleukins as uh, stated in this uh, paper have been um, suspected as playing a role. So people think there's a genetic, uh, could be genetically predetermined. Uh, can they be a post-infectious uh, cause for these fires? And, or cytokine mediated? Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the autoimmune therapies that we have used for um, the autoimmune epilepsies like an MDA and ADM don't work well for fires. There's some cases uh, where some interleukin um, antagonists, uh, as you see on the slide, like anakinra, et cetera, have been used successfully in separate case reports. But uh, as you can imagine, since this is a rare condition, there are no uh, double-blinded uh, randomized studies for this. So a little bit on refractory and super-refractory status epilepticus. Uh, refractory is when it does not respond to standard treatment, uh, including benzodiazepine and another anti-epileptic drug, whereas super refractory is when it continues for uh, 24 or more hours after the onset of anesthesia. You try to lighten the patient out from anesthesia and the patient is still in the status epilepticus. And why does the patient go into uh, refractory or super refractory status? Uh, there are many uh, hypotheses of how, why this happens. One is that the medicines that we use normally to stop in like gamma medicines don't work as well. These gamma receptors are internalized into the cell membranes. The, uh, there's an increase in glutamatergic receptors. Uh, so these medicines that we use like pencils are less effective. So there's a balance that shifts from inhibition to excitation. There could be mitochondrial failure, cellular damage, necrosis, uh, breakdown of uh, blood brain barrier, uh, activation of inflammatory pathways, etc. Okay. Uh, as far as uh, uh, role of anesthesia and refractory status epilepticus, these uh, children, as the slide that I showed that um, we've used anesthesia, uh, can help to control the seizures, but also uh, with neuroprotection um, and uh, sometimes avoid uh, com uh, complications from prolonged unconsciousness 
uh, of prolonged anesthesia. So these patients uh, usually we we'll put them 24 hours, we lighten them up, and then if they're still in status, we um, uh, try 48 hours later until uh, they break status. But I'm sure in any of your facilities, they try to um, have these patients before, and then um, a it's very complicated to manage them. Is um, We need to try to find out why they're having uh, the refractory status, and you can divide it into uh, lesional, uh, there's a stroke or anything, infectious, genetic, drugs, toxins, and immunological conditions when you can actually treat the cause of the status epilepticus. Let's jump into the second case since it's, it's 1226. And this is a 10-year-old um, a girl that uh, we saw 10 years ago when I was here uh, with Dr. Corana, and um, she was found prenatally to have multiple brain anomalies and vertebral anomalies. Uh, she had a full-term pregnancy, but was complicated by oligohydramnios, and the ultrasound already found that she had some abnormalities, um, including the hemivertebrae and scoliosis. And uh, the MRI that I'll show uh, next um, is going to show some of these problems. Early on, she developed infantile spasms, and um, these were refractory to vigabotrin. The mom explicitly didn't want to go into ACTH, so other medicines were uh, used, and uh, she basically developed refractory epilepsy. At 10 years old now, she still has uh, tonic seizures on a daily basis. She lives in a residential facility, has a tracheostomy, and her EEG pattern evolved into an Lennox Castor pattern. She's vent and trach dependent. Okay, let's see. Let's see how these work this time. Share advanced portion of the screen. Okay. Okay, let me see what people are seeing here. Now I can read to the comments a little bit better. But uh, can anybody see the video? It's still black. Okay, so we're out of the videos today. You're gonna have to trust me on this one. Um, I owe you the videos. It's within the shared screen. So it's very, can you see the EEG? Yes. EEG, but no video, I'm sorry. We have to work on sharing the videos better. It's not an individual file. The first thing that jumps to your eyes with this EEG is there's a very lateralized EEG. And it's very high amplitude in one side of the brain, on the right side. And the left side looks kind of quiet. Um, some people have described this as a hemi hypsarrhythmia or one of the modified hypsarrhythmia patterns when you have hypsarrhythmia on half of your brain. And at the time of the seizure, um, you can see the box there. I can put the video to one side. Um, Hopefully you can see that the video is running and she will have these electro decrements like is coming up in the right side of the screen right now. Can you guys see where she had the infantile spasm? Okay. Yes, can see huge voltage burst. I like that, good. So she has this huge voltage uh, burst and this fast activity at the time she would have this spasm. Um, this was a very dramatic spasm, like she would be very abrupt and she will stiffen up for about four seconds. And the video, uh, it took me a while to find an awesome video. Actually, my EEG tech found this one and um, I'm very sad that you guys are not able to see it, but. You saw the EG pattern, and um, this was a, uh, a nice, uh, awesome video. Wait a second, share a screen. 
basic video to share. Okay. So this is the brain abnormalities. Uh, can everybody see the MRI now? Okay. Chat. I don't see, I don't see where my, I cannot see my chat. Second. Okay, yes, okay. Goodness, okay. So before I go over the MRI, I have a, another poll. I'm hoping everybody had time to check the MRI. And uh, here's the poll for this question. Uh, I'm trying to make this inter as interactive as I can. Uh, I'm gonna launch the launch the poll. Okay. Out of eight. Five out of eight votes. Good, if anything, I can finish there. That's fine. So I'm glad not everybody got the question correct. So there's something to learn. That's awesome. One person answered red limitation. Nobody answered Icardius Gutierrez syndrome. One tuberous sclerosis and three Acardi syndrome. So let's just briefly go over these uh, the options. And uh, railing, I'm gonna share the results. I'm not sure if you're seeing them or not. Uh, Relly mutation usually causes uh, lysencephaly. Um, Acardis Gutierrez is, um, they have um, some liver abnormalities that are not present in this case, uh, spleen and elevated liver enzymes, so very jittery babies. Uh, tuberous sclerosis um, have cortical tubers um, and Acardi syndrome, which is in this case, I'm going to show you um, again the uh, MRI findings in this case and the salient feature here is there's a complete absence of the corpus callosum. Uh, when you look at this sagittal uh, you don't see corpus callosum. On the axial the ventricles look very parallel and that's something you see when there's no corpus callosum the same here it looks like an H. Besides that, besides that, there's this interhemispheric cyst that you can see on the sagittal T1. You can see on the uh, T2 here, there's a cyst and on the midline here. Um, and there's also some vermin hypoplasia. Um, the cortex probably doesn't look well uh, either. Uh, some cortical dysplasia. Um, usually TS, patients with tuberous sclerosis will have uh, corpus callosum and the patient with grilling um, mutation will have a completely smooth brain as it lives in cephaly. Um, so combining these uh, corpus callosum in a girl with infantile spasm, the correct answer would be um, Acardi syndrome. Now we did an evoke potential in this girl and um, some of you may be just purely epilepsy fellows and such, but I say, well, let me teach you a little bit about evoke potentials. And I pulled this uh, evoke potential that she had done when she was a baby. And um, I'm gonna launch a polling about this. Let's see how people feel.
No answers. <laughs> Anybody? Okay. That's fine. Either people stepped out to grab a drink or... No, we can't see the poll, Ignacio. You cannot see the poll? No. Oh. Maybe oh. open it again. And polling. Okay, one second. Relaunch. Allow panelists to vote. Okay. I relaunched it. Can you see it now? We could see it. Okay. Okay. So wave five is for auditory evoke potential. These are visual evoke potentials. In visual evoke potentials, we look for the P100 wave. It's a positive wave found 100 milliseconds after the stimulus. And here, each of these dotted lines uh, horizontally is 25 milliseconds. So they should be around here. And you don't see a reproducible uh, wave P100. Uh, the P300 is for the long latency auditory of potentials. They're done in more like psychology studies and in things like that. So the correct answer is absent P100. Uh, let me close this, go to the next question. So this is, a, as I said before, a Cardi syndrome and was described by Gene Cardi, a French neurologist back in 1965. He actually died recently in 2015. It is a pretty rare condition, one in 100,000 to one in 160, 67,000 newborns will have this. The classical triad and um, they would love to ask you this on your board because this is a classical pediatric um, disease, will have uh, corpus callosum agenesis, uh, chorioretinal lacunae, and infantile spasms. And the majority of these cases happen in girls. So they think is uh, associated with a mutation on the X chromosome. Other um, things that they can present with is microcephaly, this genesis, porencephalic cysts, hydrocephalus, et cetera. Um, here's an example of what the retinal lacunae look like uh, from the reference below. And you can see these basic holes in the retina in both eyes and different areas. Um, our patient also had a coloboma and therefore the evoke potentials were uh, completely absent when we did them. Um, so as I mentioned before, they think it's uh, uh, possibly caused by a gene mutation of the X chromosome. Um, Usually half of the X chromosomes are uh, inactivated by the, and, and these girls, they found a skewed inactivation of the X chromosome that's been identified, further confirming that um, is due to a genetic uh, abnormality of the X chromosome. There has been few males um, uh, described with uh, a Cardi syndrome, but usually they'll have 47 XXY. So there'll be clinic filter and a cardi. And although it's classified as an X-linked dominant disease, no poll. Although it's being classified as an X-linked dominant disease, is most of the cases are de novo. They're not inherited directly. Uh, here's a, a paper I found about the phages that these patients um, can have when you look at them in clinically. And they describe these um, spars on the lateral eyebrows that you lose them on the, at the end of the eyebrows. And um, some of them, uh, the upturned uh, nasal tip, like you can see here, and this one or this one here, and a decreased angle of the nasal bridge. Uh, pretty nonspecific, um, but it's been described. 
Um, our patient, like in this picture, early on had severe scoliosis. And some of the vertebrae only had, she only had half of them. And that's classical of patients with um, acardia syndrome. She, uh, as I mentioned before, she's trach and bent dependent. So um, this is the last slide on this patient. There's um, uh, 1240, let's go to our last case. Unless there's any questions, I don't see any questions so far. We can, maybe you'll have five minutes at the end for any questions. This is a, a two-year-old boy. Um, they start having seizures on his first day of life and birth suppression pattern on the EEG. Uh, for you who've uh, done EEGs and you see a newborn that looks awake and has birth suppression, birth suppression on the EEG is a very dramatic finding. Um, mom says that they probably were events from the first day of life and uh, there was stiffening of his body um, and uh, baby had pretty much a very extensive workup. As you can see there, the MRI was basically normal. Um, the EEG showed uh, this, which is this uh, high amplitude bursts and then flattened in between, uh, burst suppression. Um, of course, uh, I owe you big with the videos today. I'm gonna try to... Let me see. Share advance. It's a shame because I tried this before. Well, can anybody see the baby on the video or not? No. Okay. Let me take the video away here. Um, the thing that you see in this video is, uh, of course, that intermittently this baby will go flat on, their e on his EEG and will have these intermittent bursts. Um, and at the time of this flattening, this baby will have a tonic event, um, like a tonic seizure. Now, this was a newborn. In between, you have this like sort of birth suppression as I showed you before. Uh, let me go back to this. Let me share this. Okay. Poll question. Poll question. Is anybody tired of the poll questions? That was my idea. <laughs> okay, let's launch the one and the last poll, okay? This is the last one, I promise. I'm trying to make this interactive. You have to uh, believe that um, it's very dry to give a lecture with no audience, okay? So you have a baby, can, can anybody see the poll? No, let me relaunch. Relaunch poem. Okay. How about now, Charuta? Yes. Okay. Good. This is awesome. I like that when you're making questions, I think it's important to, um, that not everybody gets them right because then I wouldn't be teaching anybody anything. Um, but I think most of them are correct. I mean, three people answered non-ketotic hyperglycemia, which is a possibility, you know? Uh, Otahara syndrome, definitely. You have a baby with tonic seizures and uh, birth suppression under EEG. So that's the overarching diagnosis is Otahara, it's a syndromic diagnosis. Uh, benign familial neonatal convulsions, definitely, definitely not, because uh, the EEG, um, I'll share it, let me see if you can see the share results. 
benign familial convulsions will have a completely normal EEG background. So as soon as you say you have birth suppression on the EEG, it completely rules out benign anything. There's no benign anything that has birth suppression on the EEG. Can you guys see the uh, survey results? Okay. Yes. Okay, very good. Very good. So three, three, and one. Very good. Okay, so let's go into these last uh, few slides that I have for you today, okay? The main difference I wanted to try to make, and this um, uh, came from Sarah before, is the difference between early myoclonic encephalopathy and Otahara, also uh, named early infantile epileptic encephalopathy. Many times when deciding how to call an epilepsy syndrome, uh, one of the deciding features is the uh, most significant seizure type. For Otahara, they tend to be tonic spasms. That is the deciding thing. Both early myoclonic encephalopathy and Otahara can have birth suppression on EEG. But once you have tonic spasms and not myoclonic seizures, that makes it more Otahara uh, syndrome. Uh, so the early myoclonic can have focal myoclonus in different uh, places. They can both start at the same age, zero to three months, um, and they can both uh, evolve into spasms and hips arrhythmia, et cetera, as in this slide. Um, the etiology for Otahara, you can divide in structural, metabolic, and genetic mutations, and the genetic mutations is ex expanding as it was in this case, but one of the major things when we encounter children in uh, children with these encephalopathies is to make sure you don't have somebody with a treatable condition. So I like to pay attention to these metabolic disorders list as many of these diseases have um, treatment. And in neurology, when I'm, I'm teaching my students and residents and fellows is you don't want to miss a treatable condition. Okay, of course you want to nail down the diagnosis, but you want to make sure that, um, that you don't miss something that you can actually treat. For structural, you'll do an brain MRI, which was normal in this case for metabolic disorders. Um, some of them might need um, uh, spinal tap, you can do glycine and things like that. Uh, but many of these have now um, included the genetics panel, which I think they have decreased the need for lumbar punctures these days. Uh, as far as the early myoclonic epilepsy, a lot of them are uh, similar to Otahara syndrome, uh, but includes other different diseases as in genetic mutation, as you can see at the bottom of the slide. Um, so when you compare Otahara versus early myoclonic, the primary seizure type is one of your deciding factors, whether you have tonic spasms versus myoclonic seizures. Um, the uh, Otahara tends to have more structural versus uh, metabolic abnormalities of the early myoclonic encephalopathy, and the evolution is slightly different. Now, remember, um, the Otahara syndrome has a very grim prognosis. Uh, um, half of these patients die and the other half usually have severe psychomotor retardation. Um, so as assessment and management, you wanna image these kids, you wanna uh, make sure if they have a metabolic anomaly that you can treat and do a genetic evaluation with a comprehensive epilepsy panel. Um, there's some anecdotal evidence uh, for medications and you can see some on, uh, on the slide. Uh, the cases that we had here before we I've used ACTH and some of these medicines with uh, some success, um, but, but a lot of them evolve into uh, infantile spasms and then later on they can evolve into Lennox Gastaut. Um, you can imagine not, all, not, not a lot of these have a double blinded uh, placebo randomized control trials. As I mentioned before, 50 of them die by two years old in you know, Otahara syndrome. So um, is a very poor prognosis and um, a lot of it come from the ideology of the Otahara syndrome. In our patient um, had a positive mutation and an autosomal dominant 
mutation heterozygous uh, for the KCNQ2 uh, gene uh, with a change that you can see in the slide. And um, this is uh, now termed the early infantile epileptic encephalopathy type 7. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the KCNQ2 gene can give you something really bad as this encephalopathy or something as benign as benign neonatal seizures. Uh, remember some of these uh, channelopathies as the sodium and potassium, uh, their phenotype is uh, huge. And the spectrum goes from the very benign as in febrile seizures to uh, draw it in the case of sodium channel and the potassium channel is something similar. Um, the cases that have been described with this potassium, uh, with this KCNQ2 uh, channelopathy or uh, KCNQ2 mutation, they have severe um, intellectual disability and refractory seizures and um, we have not been able to control the patient's seizures. And um, as the case of many, uh, many patients with, when we cannot control, they, they start doctor shopping. Uh, so they went doctor shopping somewhere else. I'm, I'm actually happy being in part because the families need to um, hear this from a different person. You know, they need to hear that we're doing everything we can. And if I'm not doing anything else for the patient, it's good for me as well. Make sure that I'm not missing anything. So um, uh, that is my last slide. Uh, we have seven minutes for questions. I try to unmute everybody uh, so they can either uh, activate their microphone and ask a question or they can um, send it through the question and answer uh, window. I can see anything. Well, did anybody learn anything? Answer. Wait a second, participants. Thank you, stay safe. Thank you, Charuta, the same for you, okay? Well, I hope everybody stays safe in their um, hospitals. This is a time of um, crisis for everybody. So I hope that you guys and your families also be safe, okay? Thank you very much. Bye-bye.